Starship could be almost ready to fly again. The smallest possible Mars colony. Three more space missions launched this week, and a new look at Chinese next generation crew capsule and lunar lander. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Remember back in April when we had that first initial test launch of SpaceX Starship on Super Heavy? Now, some people considered it a success, other people considered it a failure. I am not going to judge that here. Uh, you've got a long conversation between me, Scott Manley, Marcus House, where we try to get to the bottom of that. It definitely didn't reach orbit, and it definitely tore apart its launch pad. And so this time, SpaceX is hoping to fix those two major problems, get to space, don't destroy your launch facility. And they've got a new rocket stacked up at their facility at Boca Chica. According to SpaceX, the rocket is pretty much ready to fly. They're now just waiting for approval from the FAA. And according to the FAA, they're not going to authorize a SpaceX launch until they finish fixing all of the problems that they identified after their mishap report with the success failure of the previous SpaceX Starship Super Heavy launch. Now to fix the problem, SpaceX has built a new flame diversion system, and we've seen this thing tested with hot fire tests of Super Heavy. And they're also going to be changing the way that they separate the rocket. The plan now is to use a hot fire stage separation where Starship will fire its rockets while it's still attached to the top of Super Heavy and then accelerate away from Super Heavy and hopefully not cause too much damage to the top of the rocket so that it can then be reused again on future launches. Now, when is this going to happen? The rumor mill seems to think it'll happen in mid-September, but like we're already close to mid-September now, so that seems aggressive. I have no idea, but if SpaceX is able to push through the FAA's requirements, get this thing launch certified, we could see a test in the next couple of weeks. What is the bare minimum number of people for a Mars colony? We've heard SpaceX's plans to send a million people or more to the Red Planet over the next 50 years to create a giant city on Mars, something that is completely self-sustaining and separate from planet Earth. That seems aggressive. It seems uh, overly optimistic. A team of researchers have asked the question like, what is the bare minimum number of people that you would need to send to Mars to have a colony to be able to survive? And this estimate has been run many times. And in general, you get estimates in the dozens of people, 50, 100. You need different kinds of skills, different personality types to get to a place where the colony doesn't have everybody starve and accidents wipe out everybody. Researchers set up a new simulation where they made all of the inhabitants of a Mars colony agents. And then they had the agents carry out various tasks while they went through different kinds of emergency situations and tried to just carry on the ongoing tasks of running this colony. They give the agents different personalities from agreeable, social, reactive, and neurotic. And you're like wondering, like, why do we need neurotics on our Mars colony? But in fact, it's the neurotics that were willing to take higher risks. They would sort of be clutch in a emergency situation. And so there's sort of you need all kinds of personalities to survive a Mars station. They ran the simulations for 28 years, with the colonists getting resupplied from Earth every two years with whatever they needed. And they found that you could keep the colony going down to about 22 inhabitants. Below that, it just wasn't sustainable. But as long as you were greater than 22 people, the thing was able to keep going year after year after year, getting through a variety of emergency situations. Now, keep in mind, this isn't self-sufficient. So this is not cut off from Earth. These 22 people are going to be looking forward to their care packages every couple of years from Earth. And without that, they would all die. I'm going to talk about this some more for my rant at the end of this episode, so stick around for that. Ingenuity passes 100 minutes of flight time. It is still bonkers to me that there is a robotic helicopter flying around on Mars. And it was only expected to fly just a couple of times before, you know, it got stuck in a Martian tree. I know there are no trees on Mars. You didn't have to say that. Do I even have to explain my jokes? Hmm. 
people are telling me that Triton is a star, that I said that Triton was a star in the James Webb episode. So maybe I do. And yet Ingenuity just completed its 57th flight, this time flying for 129 seconds, continuing to explore the area around the Perseverance rover, helping to map out all of the interesting places inside the Jezero crater. And when you add up all of the flight time that Ingenuity has done so far, you are greater than 100 minutes. And so like, if you total it up, a Mars helicopter has flown for more than 100 minutes on Mars. Amazing. And again, like, if anything goes to Mars and doesn't bring along several tiny little Mars helicopters, they're doing something wrong. More Mars helicopters. Two Japanese missions take off together. We got some delays, but finally, a pair of Japanese missions blasted off this week on a H-2A rocket. Now, the first mission on board is called the X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission, or XRISM, which this is a replacement for a previous mission that failed and broke up in orbit. And so this time around, they've got the spacecraft successfully out into space where it will be able to perform its mission. It's equipped with a soft X-ray spectrometer and a soft X-ray imager. And it's going to be using these two instruments to map out the hot plasma that surrounds galaxies in intergalactic space. This is places where supernova explosions and quasars have heated up this plasma around the galaxies, in some cases to millions of degrees. And it's only possible to see this stuff in the X ray spectrum, where it's glowing with really high energy photons. The other mission on board is called the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon or SLIM. The nickname for this mission is called the Moon Sniper, because the plan is that they're going to demonstrate that they can land payloads onto the surface of the moon in very specific target locations. It's gonna take about four months to reach the moon and it's going to go into orbit around the moon. And then at the appointed time, it's going to attempt to land carrying about 200 kilograms of lunar lander down to the surface of the moon and get within 100 meters of their target location. And if they can do this, then they can demonstrate that they can deliver payloads to the surface of the moon as predicted. When you think about sort of the previous Japanese mission that crashed on the moon and all of the other missions that have crashed on like landing on the moon is hard. And if the Japanese can pull this off, they'll only be the fifth nation to ever land safely on the surface of the moon. Every week, we do a vote here on this channel where you tell us what you thought was the best news of the week. And last week's vote was no contest, an exoplanet as dense as steel. So uh, thank you everyone who voted. Now we'll put up the new vote into the community tab. You're most likely to see that if you're subscribed to the channel. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. And if you saw, we released the results of our giant first year James Webb image voting uh, with Anton Petrov and Joe Scott. And so your votes count. Every vote matters. And so if you haven't already subscribe to the channel, when you see the votes come up in the community tab, participate and help us figure out what is best in space. India lands on the moon again. Now we've been talking about India's successful landing on the surface of the moon with the Chandrayaan three mission with the Vikram lander and the Pragyan rover. And we're going to talk a second about the end of the mission. But just a couple of days ago, the lander took off from the surface of the moon and did a very short hop. So they only lifted off about 40 centimeters off the moon, moved about 30 to 40 centimeters sideways, and then landed again. This is important because if you can demonstrate that not only can you land on the moon, but then you can take off again and move to a new location, then that really opens up more and more exploration opportunities because you can go fly around to where there are interesting science locations, deploy rovers, move around. So this could be the beginning of a pretty exciting kind of technological demonstration on the surface of the moon. But the mission itself is now probably dead. 
And that's because the landing location has gone into the lunar night before they were getting plenty of sunlight into their solar panels, keeping everything nice and toasty and giving both the lander and the rover plenty of electricity to do all the things that they needed to do. But now the landing location has gone into the lunar night, the temperatures are minus 120 Celsius. And this is too cold for the batteries and the electrical systems to maintain for very long. When you've got spacecraft on Mars, or like the Voyagers or New Horizons, they're equipped with a decaying chunk of plutonium. And this is able to provide not only electricity for the spacecraft, but also heat to keep all of its internal components warm, even though it's not getting very much sunlight. The budget for the Chandrayaan-3 is only about $75 million. They weren't using enriched plutonium to keep this mission warm. And so as soon as the sun goes down, the rover and the lander are going to get cold. Now they're doing their best. They're able to fill up the batteries on both spacecraft, and hopefully they'll be able to keep them as warm as possible for as long as they can. But their estimates are that they're not going to survive the lunar night. But we don't know, it could happen. And so we'll check again in about two more weeks. And hopefully, the spacecraft will wake up and continue to do more science on the surface of the moon. But even if they don't, it was a tremendous accomplishment. Finally, one quick time lapse video I just wanted to share with you. This is from the European Space Agency. This is their new Norcia station in Australia, and it's tracking the moon and it was transmitting data to and from Chandrayaan 3 during this time lapse. But I just it's so cool to see the giant dish directing itself directly at the moon as the moon rises. Another space mission from India just took off. Despite Chandrayaan 3 wrapping up, India is not resting on its laurels. They launched another mission, this time to the sun. Well, not exactly to the sun. It's a solar observing mission. It's going to be flying to the sun Earth L1 Lagrange point. So the mission is called Aditya L1. And the L1 is for the location. And this is similar, the European Space Agency and NASA have the SOHO spacecraft, other spacecraft are flying at the L1 Lagrange point. And what's great is that it's this sort of perfect place that's positioned in between the Earth and the sun, it always remains in the same spot. And so it can image the sun, but it can also transmit all of its data back to Earth. It's equipped with seven instruments, and it's going to be examining the solar atmosphere, the environment around the sun, the surface of the sun, and really contribute to this giant emphasis on the sun. When you think about it, we've got the Parker Solar Probe, we've got the Solar Orbiter spacecraft, we've got the new Daniel K. Inoue solar telescope down here on Earth. And now we've got India's Aditya L1 mission joining this as well as uh, solar telescopes from China and other places. So really, the sun is the focus of a lot of research now. It's currently on its way to L1. It's gonna take about three months to reach its final location and then begin its science operations. The most distant galactic field lines ever seen. The Earth is surrounded by a giant magnetic field, the sun is surrounded by a giant magnetic field and galaxies are surrounded by giant magnetic field lines made up of all of the ionized gas and dust collected within the galaxy itself. And astronomers are able to measure these magnetic field lines, what they do is they look at the dust that is floating around in the galaxy. And the dust will align itself to the magnetic field lines, and then emit radiation that is polarized. And so they use the Atacama large millimeter array to be able to map out the polarized light from the galaxy and use that to essentially draw the magnetic field lines that are around the galaxy. This works with galaxies that are relatively close to us. But now astronomers have demonstrated that they can use the same technique, even if the galaxy is extremely far away. And so the most distant galaxy that this process has been done with now is a galaxy where the light has been traveling to us for over 11 billion years. So we're seeing the galaxies that looked just a couple of billion years after the Big Bang. And one of the big questions in astronomy is like, what impact do these magnetic field lines have in the evolution of a galaxy? How do they contribute to star formation or stop star formation and help with the overall long term direction that a galaxy takes? Good news, our question shows are about to return. So our next live show is going to be happening on Monday, September the 11th. And then we will be releasing that as a question show just a couple of days after that. But if you want to sort of catch up on the backlog, we've got a giant playlist that you can go through with 1000s of questions at this point. 
So uh, we'll put a link to that here and in the show notes. But I can't wait to get back to doing some of the live shows. Hiatus is over. It's time to get back to work. China shows off its lunar lander and next generation crew capsule. Now, as you know, the Chinese have stated their goal of landing two people on the surface of the moon before 2030. As part of this process, they're developing an entire new collection of spacecraft. Their mission is going to be very similar to the way NASA's Artemis three mission is going to work. They're going to have two separate launches. One launch is going to fly their lunar lander into orbit around the moon. And then a second launch is going to carry three astronauts to lunar orbit. And then two of the astronauts, or they call them Taikonauts in China, are going to transfer over to the Chinese lunar lander, and then it's going to descend down to the lunar surface, they're going to get out collect samples, I don't know, play golf, <laughs> I'm not sure what the plan is, then return to the lunar lander, fly up to orbit, reconnect with the crew capsule and then return back to Earth. And this week, China released some renderings of what these spacecraft are going to look. So we've got a much better view of what these spacecraft will look. And they're very reminiscent of the Apollo era with both the crew capsule as well as the lunar lander. Now, the crew capsule is going to be used for missions close to Earth as well. It should be capable of carrying seven crew up to the Chinese space station. So they'll have a way similar to Crew Dragon to carry large numbers of crew to and from their space station. As I said earlier, I'm going to rant a little more about a Mars colony. But first, I want to thank our patrons, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Chiblin, Jay Dennis, David Gilton, Ed, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Varioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our supporters on Patreon. Join the community. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. I try to be really clear about this story about the Mars colony. This is not a self sufficient Mars colony. This is just like what it would take for human beings living in the dangerous environment on Mars to like not die out that as long as you gave them regular supplies of food and electronics and technology and whatever they need, then they would be able to keep on going. But like a bigger question is, like, what would it take to have a self sufficient civilization on Mars, you know, people talk about like, we don't want to keep all of our eggs in one basket. And so if something really awful happens to Earth, we want to make sure that Mars is our second home. But having a modern industrial economy be self sufficient on Mars would require a ludicrous number of people. There was a really interesting estimate that I saw from Charles Strauss. He's the author of Accelerando and has done some thinking in this matter. And in his opinion is that it would take many orders of magnitude beyond the million people that Elon Musk thinks would be required for a city on Mars, like tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe even a billion people to have all of the infrastructure, all of the technological capabilities to keep a population of people alive on such a harsh environment as Mars. Like think about it, that there's going to be a lot of things that you just can't do on Mars. Like you can't just walk outside and breathe. You can't cut down trees and build your house. You can't go into the forest and harvest berries to survive or go fishing. You're going to have to run your hydroponics facility. You're going to have to mine regolith. You're going to have to protect yourself from the radiation. You're going to have to build electronics and robotics and all that kind of stuff. And these are the capabilities, like the sum requirement of a giant civilization. And like, according to Strauss, you would need like maybe a billion people, like even on Earth, like maybe China would have enough people if it wanted to run a completely self sufficient civilization at a level of technology, similar to our modern economy, maybe they could pull it off, but maybe even not maybe it takes 8 billion people interacting with each other to maintain the level of technological sophistication that we like. And so we've seen in the past when populations get cut off from larger groups, we think about people walked over to Tasmania, and then Tasmania got got cut off, they lost the ability to do things like fish, because they just didn't have enough skills and specialization in the populace. And so without a really large number of people, it's gonna be really hard for a place to be self sufficient. And so if you want to go to Mars and live there for the rest of your life, you're still going to be dependent on Earth 
probably forever. And so it really sort of makes you think about like, what are the benefits of having a self-sufficient colony on Mars? Anyway, I'm sure you're going to deeply disagree with me. And I look forward to our argument in the comments below. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week.